First thing to talk about with regards to the text itself is a little bit about the number symbolism. So everything in the Divine Comedy is either three or ten or a combination of three and ten. Why three? Because that is the number of God, right? And this is the Divine Comedy, right? So this is a poem about religion and the spirit. And so three, 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 and of course three times three, nine, become central numbers, right? Ten is a very important number because it's, according to the Pythagoreans, the ancient Greek mathematicians, it's the perfect number, one plus two plus three plus four. And if you make little dots, it makes a perfectly balanced triangle. So three and ten. There are three volumes to the work. There are three kingdoms. Each volume has 33 cantos, except the first that has one, which is 33 plus 33 plus 33 plus one is 100. Just, you know, this staggeringly symmetrical use of number in the comedy. Actually, a couple of years ago, I'll tell you about this later, I was teaching the Paradiso, the undergraduate class. I'm sorry, it wasn't the graduate class, the undergraduate class. I was talking about the line of the Paradiso, 33rd canto of the third volume of the poem, in which Dante finally has his vision of God. And it's line 81 of the 33rd canto of the third volume. And I was saying a third volume, 33rd canto, 81. What is 81? 8 plus 1 is 9. 9 is the square of 3 and so forth. This girl came up and she said, after class, not in class, you know, didn't embarrass me, came up and she said, actually, you know, 81 is also the fourth power of three. And I thought, oh, I never would have thought of that in a million years, you know. And so then I started thinking of the fourth power of three. What about the third power of four? And then I began, and eventually I got a very nice article out of that. And I gave her credit in a footnote. Hai Yang. I don't know whatever happened to her. I hope she's still studying her Dante. So three is a very important number. Now, so why do I bring it up? And this whole chart is worth looking at because, you know, three, and you get three times three equals nine. You get four is the number of the physical world, the elements, fire, air, water, and earth. So three plus four equals seven. That's the number of everything. That's why seven. This is the most lucky number in Western culture if you're going to bet on a roll of the dice. You pick seven. I guess Chinese would pick eight, right? <laughs> so, and then three times four is an important number, 12, and of course 10. That's why 10 is important right there. 10 fingers. So, three is important, and what Dante, the rhyme scheme that Dante chooses for his poem is called Terza Rima, because the whole poem comes in three line packages. Three line stanzas that in English are called tercets. And the way it works is like this Nel mezzo del camin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura, che la derita via era smarita. So the first line of the tercet rhymes with the third line of the tercet. First line of the stanza rhymes with the third line of the stanza. Okay. And so that's nice, but the really, really neat thing is that this middle line defines the framing rhyme of the next step. So Oscura tells us what this, these two rhymes are going to be. Ah, quanto a dir qual era e cosa dura, esta selva selva forte, che nel pensiero di dove la paura. And then forte, tan e amara, che poco e più morte. And it goes on like that. So it's, a, it's three line stanzas, but they're tied together by this technique of the middle line defining the framing rhymes of the next stanza. And that goes on for 14,233 lines. Now, having said that, Italian has got a lot of rhymes. The old joke is, you know, give me an Italian name that doesn't end in O. You know, so I mean, you know, a lot of Italian words 
Uh, there are a lot of rhymes, many, many more rhymes than English. That's why you don't find many translators trying to actually reproduce this rhyme scheme. Some of them will rhyme these and not try to do this. If you want to see an English translator that does it, and does it quite well, take a look at the old Penguin translation, Penguin Books translation by Dorothy, Dorothy Sayer. She actually keeps to Dante's rhyme scheme. And, uh, you know, occasionally it causes some awkwardness in phrasing, and occasionally it's not as accurate as it might be, and so forth. You'll notice Mandeldown, no rhyme, you know, but it's still beautiful, it's still beautiful. So terza rima means third rhyme, and it's kind of a dance. It's left, right, one step back, and then left, right. It's like, it's like waves, you know, in a tide, comes in, comes in, comes in, comes in, comes in, comes in. So there is progress, but it's a kind of very slow and, and a beautiful kind of repetitive progress. A gentle but insistent momentum. I think that's a beautiful description of the effect of this poetic form. So it's a complex poetic structure. It has a practical advantage. Again, I never thought of this until a few years ago. I didn't think of it myself. I read about it. It makes it obvious when a line or a stanza has been left out in copying or when the wording has been changed. So you've got to remember these medieval poets, they were not going to give their manuscript to a publisher and then have him go, 10,000 copies, all exactly the same. They were copied by hand. And the way scriptoria, or places in the Middle Ages where manuscripts were copied, worked, is one person in the scriptorium would read orally the text, and then there'd be five or six or twelve scribes out there, and they would be writing down what was being read. So you can imagine how easy it would be to get a bad, a bad copy, you know, uh, corrupt. Uh, that's why scholars spend uh, years, and in, in the case of Dante, centuries trying to figure out what exactly is the best possible text, because there are many different variations in the manuscripts. The comedy is a triumph of imagination, Dante creates a fantasy world as detailed and as realistic, as close to the science of his day as he could make it. Chardy has a nice John Chardy is one of the translators, also a good poet. Dante is not just taking a walk, he's constructing a universe. And again, that's one of the reasons that it's such a fascinating poem. It's like going to a totally different, totally different world, right? It's like reading Tolkien. I think that's a large part of the attraction of Lord of the Rings. You've got a whole geography. You've got different races of beings, you know. You, there's maps, there's diagrams. And likewise, there are diagrams of Dante's world as well. There's an early diagram of the Inferno showing the various levels of the conical structure of hell. There is Sayer's diagram. I just mentioned her. That was the translation that I first read when I was younger than you, undergraduate. Um, and my brother actually was taking university courses and I was in high school. I was going to be a television repairman. That was my goal in life. Sometimes think I might have been better off as a television repairman. But in any case, my brother was reading this book because he was taking a great books class in his university, first year of university. And I remember looking at that diagram and thinking, boy, that is neat. What could this possibly be about? And I started reading, and I thought, not for me, you know. <laughs> no, no, you know, not what I thought. But the diagram fascinated me. And I still like the diagram because it, it gives some sense of the vastness of the inferno, you know, the actual sort of uh, sense of the size of the various parts of the inferno. A lot of critics would say, oh, this is, you know, Dante never meant to be looked at in such an incredibly detailed and realistic way. This is Guy Rafa. He's got this site that I mentioned earlier, Dante Worlds, on the internet. Very inspiring. Must be a, a great teacher of Dante and uh, very, uh, very good, uh, simple explanations of the poem. So he has a, a much more schematic, uh, not so realistic, depiction. The thing that's nice about his diagram is that it gives the canto numbers. 
it's always difficult with the, you know, divine comedy. You're thinking, of, where was that? You, you usually know, like it's Inferno or Purgatorio or Paradiso. You think, okay, that's when Dante is. Uh, I think he's in the wood of the suicide. Or the suicide. What is what canto is that? You know. Well, if you have this, you just look suicides, um, violence against themselves here, canto thirteen, right? So you can easily find the canto number for the episode that you're trying to look at. It also inspires illuminations or illustrations, beautiful medieval illuminated manuscripts of the. Divine Comedy. Here is the first page from a 14th century manuscript. It's not that much long uh, after Dante himself uh, died, after the poem was published, or not published, but released to the public. And here's Dante looking up at the heavens. Here's Dante. Now this, you can see right away, the illuminator had the idea this was a dream vision, that the whole poem occurred as a dream. And that's a very common kind of medieval poem. Piers Plowman, for example, the great 14th century work of English medieval literature, is a dream vision. But there's no evidence that Dante meant it to be taken as a dream. So the Illuminator really has got this wrong. He's, he's full of sleep. He was so full of sleep. He wasn't paying attention, but he didn't actually fall asleep and then have a dream about going through the, uh, the three worlds of the afterlife. So this, in any case, here's the mountain. Here's the sun. He's sleeping. There he is confronting the three animals, the three beasts that block his way up the mountain. If you read the first canto, you'll know all about this. Here is a uh, manuscript, uh, again 14th century Italian, the end of Purgatorio and the beginning of Paradiso. But just put that in to show you how beautifully done that is. That's the kind of decoration that would only be used for a sacred text, something like a Bible maybe works of St. Augustine, but a vernacular uh, text, a text in the ordinary language, very, very seldom do you get anything that beautiful. And of course, that is, that is Beatrice, who is Dante's guide in the last uh, section of the poem. There's William Blake. Blake did a series of engravings illustrating divine comedy. This is the three beasts again. You can see much more realistic beasts, but also... Blake puts Beatrice in there, kind of helping Dante, or looking on, but of course that's, there's no evidence in the poem that she was present at that point. And there's Doré, one of Donald Stone's favorite artists. And this, I like Doré's illustrations of the Divine Comedy because again, they give the sense of scale. I mean, this is just going into the entrance of hell, and you see Dante and Virgil down there, very tiny, going into this huge, gaping hole in the ground. Okay, let's stop there and look at the poem. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, I found myself within a shadowed forest, for I had lost the path that does not stray. Well, we could spend the rest of the class talking about those first three lines. First of all, it's a first-person narrative. That's unusual. Right? You think about long narrative poetry before Dante, not many, any first-person narration. Now, there is first-person narration within the epic. For example, Homer's Odyssey. Remember, Odysseus arrives at the land of the Phaeacians and hears the bard singing about the Trojan War and he weeps. And then they recognize, oh, you're, you know, he has to admit, I'm Odysseus. They say, tell us the story of your adventure. So he goes back and tells how he got to Phaeacia, how he escaped, or how he left Troy, and how he had so many troubles on the way home. Likewise, in the Aeneid, Aeneas arrives at the court of Dido, Queen Dido. Dido asks him to tell the story of the fall of Troy and his voyages. And so he goes back for two books. We get a first-person narration. But this is a first-person narration that begins at the beginning, first-person. The whole thing is focused on a first-person narrator. So it makes a big difference, right? First-person narration has got intimacy that you don't get in third-person narration. It's got a kind of sense of, of personal involvement. You know, if a person comes up to you and says, I've got a story 
it happened to me. You know, you need oh, it happened to you. Your first person account, you know, eyewitness is there. It has a, a, a greater drama, and there's a greater sense of intimacy between the storyteller and the person who is listening or the person who is reading. So when I had journeyed, and there you get the idea of life as a journey, right? Half, half of our life's way, well, that dates the poem. Because in the Bible it says the years of our life are four score and ten. A score is twenty. Four times twenty is sixty, plus ten is seventy. Even I can do that. Half of seventy is thirty-five. Dante was born in 1265. Had 35, 1300, right? So that's one of the many ways we know that Dante imagines the journey to occur in the millennium year. And just like you know, year 2000, everybody was worried, is the world going to come to an end? Is there going to be a computer virus that's going to destroy my internet connection? And, and not, of course, nothing happened, but, you know, people worry at the turn of this, the century. So it had a kind of symbolic significance for Dante. It's 1300 when he makes this journey. He's, well, 36, 35, 35 going on, 36. 36 when he was exiled from Florence. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, well, that's important too, you know. When I had journeyed, you think, okay, this is something that happened to him. But then he doesn't say my life's journey, he says our life's journey. Now, mezzo del cammino di nostra, plural, vita, right? So the idea is we're involved in this journey. It's not just Dante's journey, it's our journey. And from the very beginning, then, Dante wants the reader to identify with... So in some sense, it's you know the journey of Dante Alighieri, a 14th century Florentine, specifically a historical, real person. In another sense, it's the journey of all of us. It's the journey of every man. You know, almost the every person of the medieval play, every man. When I journeyed half of our life's way... I found myself within a shadowed forest. So the forest, you know, today we think, yeah, forests are neat. You know, I'd love to go see the sequoias, you know, wander in the forest, and camp out in the forest, you know. In the Middle Ages, forests were scary places. You didn't want to go to a forest, right? Medieval Europe was still very wild. You know, not a lot of uh, towns, not a lot of settlements. And so forests were places where you would meet robbers, or perhaps monsters of some kind, uh, not a place that you would think of the old fairy tales. You know, you don't go in a, in a forest. A forest in a fairy tale is a dangerous and sad place you wouldn't want to be. So he's lost in a forest. Now, at this point, I always tell this story. And I don't know. I'm afraid a lot of you have heard this before, and it sort of embarrasses me, but I'll tell it again. When I first went to Cape Breton, which is a place in eastern Canada, I went by myself. My wife and daughter were still in Saskatchewan, another part of Canada where I'd been working. And she was still in school. I had to go in, in, in January, to begin in January, so I had to leave. And she stayed in school, finished her year, and then they came. I was living by myself in Cape Breton. And in the spring, you know, I had to get out. I was hard, working hard in a quite boring job, a tense job in administration at the university there. And so I thought, well, I'll take a hike. And I went down to the seacoast, beautiful seacoast there. And I thought, well, you know, there's no trail here. It's, it's too bad. I'd like to walk along the seacoast. And I thought, that's all right. There's some animal trails. And, you know, I can't get lost because the sea is there. And I can hear the surf and I can see the sea. And all I have to do, I park the car, you know. And uh, then I started up the coast. And I thought, all I have to do is I'll turn around and I'll walk straight back, keep this, you know, keep it on my right going up, keep it on my left coming back, can't get lost. Because if I follow the coast, I'll run into the car. So I got up there quite a ways. And I got a little bit through the heavy forest and rocks and stuff. And I got a little bit of far away from the, 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 the ocean. And I thought, no problem, I can still hear the waves. But then a wind came up, strong wind. And I could no longer hear the waves. I had no idea where I was, and I, these paths had gone in a kind of, you know, like a, like a branch, like this. And I had gone like that, and I came back, and I didn't know which path I should take to get back. So in any case, I was out there for about 
three and a half hours. And at first, you know, so ha ha, I'm lost, and then I'm lost, and then I'm lost, and then you know, I'm thinking, you know, so great, you know, I'm in this new job, and, and they're going to have to call the RCMP, you know, the helicopters, the dogs, you know, and it'll be all over the papers, you know, uh, new dean at university, lost in woods, you know, expense for his rescue, you know, estimated at ten thousand dollars, you know, I'd be the laughing stock of the whole place. So anyway, I finally got that. So it's not, you know, it is, it is a scary, I mean, I think Dante may have actually had the experience himself. It's a terrifying thing to be lost in wood. For I had lost the path that does not stray. Well, the path that does not stray is, stray is obviously the path that will lead him to the goal where he wants to go, which is either salvation, God, happiness, however you want to define it. Ah, it is hard to speak of what it was, that savage forest, dense and difficult, which even in recall renews my fear. So even the memory of the situation makes Dante afraid once again. But to retell the good discovered there, I'll also tell the other things I saw. So the good that he refers to here, we don't know what it is at this point, but what he's referring to is the fact that he gets help, right? Virgil comes and leads him out of the forest and eventually leads him back to the path that leads to happiness. I cannot clearly say how I had entered the wood. I was so full of sleep, just at the point where I abandoned the true path. So if the wood is a wood of sin or a wood of error, a wood that leads to unhappiness, what Dante is saying is you don't deliberately choose to go there. It's something that happens when you're not paying attention. You know that horrible feeling, you wake up 4 o'clock in the morning and you think, what am I doing here? Oh, my whole life has been a mistake. You know one of those horrible nights like that? I'm on the wrong path, you know. Uh, I don't know what my future should be, you know. Should I stay in university? Should I marry my boyfriend, you know? Should I study abroad? And you begin thinking of all these things. Well, that's Dante's situation. It's, in a sense, one of the ways you can look at it is as a midlife crisis. You know, that idea of midlife crisis, that, you know, halfway through a person's life, they begin to see that life is no longer uh, going like this, that it's starting to go like that. And all of a sudden they begin questioning, you know, uh, is, is what I've been doing the right kind of thing? Am I married to the right person? You know, maybe I should get divorced. Maybe I should move to a different country. Maybe I should buy a sports car. Maybe I should quit my job and sail around the world on a freighter, you know, anything to kind of, you know, to come to terms with the question of mortality. But when I'd reached the bottom of a hill, now we begin to get some real geography here, it's not just a forest, but now we've got a hill, it rose along the boundary of a valley that had harassed my heart with so much fear, I looked on high and saw its shoulders clothed already by the rays of that same planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads. So now it's not just a forest, a dark and frightening forest. It's a forest in a valley, and there's a mountain. And Dante is down here. Right? That's where he spent the night. This, I mean, it's bad enough being lost. I was lost during late afternoon. If I'd been there all night, I would have been really beside myself. So he spent a night lost in this wood, and now the, he sees the sun rise. He's in a valley. The valley is probably the valley that's in the Bible. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Famous passage from the Psalms. So he's in this low point of his life, symbolically, he sees the sun, that's the planet. Planet comes from the Greek word that means wanderer, a wanderer. So anything in the heavens that seems to move can be called a planet, and since the sun moves every day from horizon to horizon, Dante here refers to it as a planet. So the sun is a symbol of God, right? This pun that we have in English does not exist in Italian. But still, the idea of the sun as a symbol of God is common in all Western literature. So I looked on high and saw 
the shoulders of the hill, clothed, bathed, already in the rays of that same planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads. At this my fear was somewhat quieted, for through the night of sorrow I had spent, the lake within my heart felt terror present. So, it's, as I say, it's a night. We spent a full night lost in the dark wood. Now, here we get the first simile of the poem. The epic simile, you probably know already, an extended comparison using explicit words of comparison, like in English, like or as, which the poet uses to ornament and extend the meaning of his poem. And just as he who with exhausted breath, having escaped from sea to shore, turns back to watch the dangerous waters he has quit, so did my spirit, still a fugitive, turn back to look intently at the pass that never has let any man survive. So a pass means a narrow place, hard to get through, that leads to somewhere you want to go, the usual, you know, a mountain pass. Right, you have to go up to the pass, get through the pass, and you can go beyond the mountain. So this situation that he's been in has been like one of these challenging passes. It's never let any man survive. Right? The metaphor is beautiful. The metaphor is that of a person who has just escaped shipwreck. He's managed to get to shore right, with exhausted breath, Having escaped, he turns back to look at the waters he has left, you know, see what he has managed to uh, survive. So he looked back at this point in his life which was nearly mortal, nearly fatal. Moving again, I tried the lonely slope. So now he begins to try to climb the mountain, right? My firm foot always was the one below. Now, if you check the Princeton site or the uh, commentaries, you'd find everybody has a, an interpretation for this. I think one of the simplest interpretations is he was very eager to climb the mountain. Because uh, if you're a mountain climber, I used to be a mountain climber, there is a thing called the rest step. It's the way you climb a mountain when you're really exhausted or where you don't have very much oxygen, you're getting really hot. And it's where you move your foot up once like this, and then you move the other one up like that, and then you move this one up like that, and then you move that one up like that, and then you move this one up like that, and then you move that one up like that. And I can remember being a kid and climbing the mountains and seeing these old guys climbing like that and laughing at them. And then about an hour and a half later, you know, and here they'd be coming. No, they never stopped to rest. They just, they just kept going like that forever. So, but if you don't do that, then you're going like this. You know, you're going very quickly up the mountain. So I think it could mean just he's very eager to ascend the mountain. And almost where the hillside starts to rise, look there, a leopard, very quick and live, a leopard covered with a spotted hide. So now Dante's blocked by these three animals, right? He did not disappear from sight, but stayed. Indeed, he so impeded, blocked, my ascent, that I had often to turn back again. So the first animal he confronts is this leopard, una lonza. Nobody really knows, maybe a lynx. I was just reading this morning, I decided to look this up on the net and see what I could find about a lonza. Some people think it's a lynx, some people think it's a leopard, some kind of large wild cat that lived in the Alps and in the Apennines, the mountains that run down the middle of Italy. He did not disappear from sight, but stayed. Indeed, he so impeded my ascent that I had often to turn back again. The time was the beginning of the morning. The sun was rising now in fellowship with the same stars that had escorted it when divine love first moved those things of beauty, so that the hour and the gentle season gave me good cause for hopefulness on seeing that beast before me with the speckled skin. So things look, at first they're a little scary, but then Dante thinks, I can deal with this. It's the morning. Now we know, dawn, you know, that's the best time, day, new life, new beginning, new hope. And it's spring. In the Middle Ages, people thought that the world was created 
around the time of the vernal equinox, right? March 21st, 22nd. And uh, this was also the first month, March was the first month of the year in the Roman calendar. So this was, you know, the beginning of the year, just like Chinese New Year, you know, a time of hope, you clean out the house, you pay off your debts, you reconcile with your enemies, and you start a new life, right? So it's a gentle season. But hope was hardly able to prevent the fear I felt when I beheld the lion, his head held high and ravenous with hunger. Even the air around him seemed to shudder. This lion seemed to make his way against me. And then a she-wolf showed herself. She seemed to carry every craving in her leanness. She had already brought despair to many. The very sight of her so weighted me with fearfulness that I abandoned hope of ever climbing up that mountain slope. So this is, if you're tracking the kind of, you know, psychological situation in the poem, this is the nadir. Not Ralph, but this kind of a nadir means the very low point, right? Dante is on the verge of giving up hope. That, you know, maybe not seem that serious, but that's despair. That's the sin of despair, where you think your sin is so great that God can't forgive you. And that's the only sin that can't be forgiven. Because if you believe God can't forgive you, then you won't ask for forgiveness. If you don't ask for forgiveness, you can't be forgiven. It's like going to the doctor, and he says, you'll be all right as long as you take this injection. You say, I'm not taking any injection. What can he do? You refuse treatment. So this is sort of the, the very bottom of Dante's whole journey, when he is on the verge of giving up hope. But just as he gives up hope, of course, then there's an intervention then he receives the divine grace in the form of Virgil. 